Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jimmy Ranamani from Brand South Africa, and I will be your program director for today. Uh, I'll be directing the program for the South Africa Investment Summit. But before we proceed, uh, colleagues, I think let's just observe some housekeeping rules. Uh, let's keep our phones on vibration uh, on silent. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, as we actually proceed with the South African Investment Summit, we are honored to have uh, our political leadership in our midst. Uh, so I would like to start this, the proceedings by acknowledging the presence of uh, the Deputy Minister in the Presidency of South Africa, uh, the Honorable Kenny Morolong. I'll also like to actually acknowledge His Excellency High Commissioner Jarama Mawolo, South Africa's High Commissioner to the UK and Northern Ireland, uh, as well as embassies from the uh, KwaZulu Natal province, as well as the Northwest province, uh, executives that are present here, and yourself, our esteemed guest. Uh, the reason we actually so it freed South Africa to organize and host a, a, an investment summit uh, on the sidelines of AFSIC. Is that as South Africa, we are on an investment drive as part of uh, supporting our country investment uh, strategy. And we saw this as a platform fit for that. Uh, but I will not talk much more on, the, on that one. Uh, we have speakers who are already uh, on the stage and we'll actually also have a panel discussion later on which will unpa unpack the type of investment that we are looking for as a country. Uh, on that note, uh, I would also like to request His Excellency uh, High Commissioner Jeremiah Mamawulu to actually welcome and open the session officially for us. Thank you. Good morning. Deputy Minister in the Office of the Presidency of the Republic of South Africa, Honorable Kenny Morolo, MEC for Provincial Treasury, Northwest Province in the Republic of South Africa, Ms. Kinezi Mosenohi, MEC for Cooperative, Cooperative Governance, Human Settlement and Traditional Affairs, Northwest Province in the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Wachem Mulapisi, MEC for Public Works and Infrastructure, KwaZulu Natal Province in the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Martin Mayer, organizers of the Investing in Africa Conference, esteemed ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my honor to welcome you to South Africa Country Summit on the sideline of Investing in Africa Conference. The South Africa Investment Summit is hosted by several South African entities, both private and public, led by Brand South Africa and the South African High Commission in the United Kingdom. These entities include Business Unit, Unity South Africa, Infrastructure South Africa, APSA, and the Development Bank of South Africa. 2024 is an important year for South Africa as our country celebrates its 30 years of democracy. And this is also a year in which we saw the ushering of a new government of national unity. The objective of the South Africa Country Summit is therefore to reassure the investment community following these elections that the new government is still committed to implementing reforms aimed at fast-tracking economic growth and investment in South Africa. We have just completed the Deputy President of our country, His Excellency, Mr. Paul Machetile, leading a delegation of ministers of government of national unity, completed a week here in the UK, and with a clear message, South Africa is united, South Africa is ready to do business. 
Through the various presentations here today, you will hear from different stakeholders that South Africa is a viable destination for foreign direct investment and possesses unique strengths which makes it an industrial hub on the African continent and a source of high quality exports. Furthermore, our Northwest province and the University of Stellenbosch will, as part of today's program, provide us with a snapshot of some investment projects in their specific localities. Whilst uh, Honorable Kenny Morolong, the South Africa Deputy Minister in the Presidency, will deliver the keynote address and set the tone in today's panel discussions. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that by the end of the summit, we would have invigorated you, your interest in South Africa as a trade and investment partner. Without further ado, welcome to South Africa Investment Summit. Thank you. This is who we are. More than 60 million different voices echoing in harmony from the southernmost part of the continent. Where ordinary people have carved their names in an extraordinary history by showing the world that peace is always better than war. Our reach is not limited by our borders, bringing joy in people's hearts and a spark of rhythm to their moves. This is the welcome home of opportunity, inspiring millions to look here in search of a better life. And sharing our best with the world, we are home to undulating mountains, flowers, endless seas, the beautiful animal kingdom, and the ever-changing seasons that color our world. We are the birthplace of humanity and a showcase of human excellence. We believe in South Africa. We are inspired by our victories of the past and our strong institutions to overcome the challenges of today and build a better tomorrow. This is who we are, South African. South Africa, inspiring new ways. This is a message by Brand South Africa. Thank you, High Commissioner. I thought it would be proper for us to close your speech with that uh, message from that video uh, curated by Brand, Brand South Africa. But also to actually, before we get into our presentations, to actually uh, start off by showcasing who we are as South Africa. Uh, our next speaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is actually MEC Mosenofi from the Northwest Province. MEC, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ndate Jimmy, for the Opportunity Program Director. His Excellency, the High Commissioner Mamabolo, and the Deputy Minister in the Presidency. Let me take this opportunity to appreciate and also acknowledge the two MECs that have joined us, but importantly yourselves, as our guests, as it has been stated. Northwest province, it's located in South Africa. It's a landlocked province bordering Botswana and other, other provinces. Importantly is that we are a population of 3.8 million people, according to the recent statistics report. We are a home to the big five residing in the Madikwe Nature Reserve and Pilanesberg Nature Reserve. Of importance is that our conservation estate is located within about 14 nature reserves in the, in the province and that presents an opportunity for commercialization, especially in that environment. We have a politically stable, province. Recently, obviously, we are not a part of the GNU, but because of the decisions that have been taken nationally, we also adhere to the objectives and agreements that have been made 
in the GNU. And importantly, we have a clear regulation tariff framework supported by regulatory institutions that are robust and functioning. We have two renowned heritage sites, which is the Taunskal and the Freddie Ford Dome uh, heritage site. We are a home to also the iconic Sun City and host Northwest University in two campuses. We have about three vocational training institutions, including two specialized colleges focusing on agriculture and tourism. Our healthcare services, both from private and public sector, we have two primary hospitals, tertiary hospital, community health centers, and more than 180 clinics across the length and breadth of the province. We have significant cultural sites, which is Gaditsweni and Dinkwani. And that also forms part of the tourism basket, which also includes um, opportunities in the conservation estate. Our GDP has increased in the year 2023 from to 1.9% from 0.6% in 2022, and projected to increase by 0.5% and 1.3% in 2024 and 2025, respectively. The total land use of commercial agriculture is 50% of the total land size and contributing 39.7% of the total income of the industry. Northwest province is the second biggest, biggest contributor on income of sales and goods in the mining industry. In comparison with other provinces, it is also the largest employer, uh, the mining industry in Northwest. The province has a total of more than 19,000 kilometers of road networks, and we are expanding. This is a combination of TART, paved and alternative a road construction material and also gravel road. Our rail network is across all towns in the province, connecting to the bordering country, Botswana and, the prov and different provinces. We have two airports, one with international license and one catering for domestic traveling. The province in the recent years has experienced water challenges, but we are happy to announce in the past two years we've invested significantly significantly in the provision of water by upgrading our water infrastructure. And we have completed about 80% of the projects. While we are busy with the 20% of the projects to be completed, we are also expanding uh, and building capacity in terms of our water resource in the province and safeguarding of the infrastructure. More than 90% of our households and business in the province have access to energy. But also given the positioning of the province, and its climate condition. We have seen in the recent past the, uh, the, the, the opportunities of solar farming, including an increase in solar plants in the province. We have also 90% connectivity in terms of internet and broadband infrastructure. In terms of our opportunities in the province, I'm not sure why they are not moving the slide, but I have moved. <laughs> The, we have um, the province boasts vibrant economy backed by concerted efforts implemented to drive growth. The province has made significant progress in ensuring that the following are in place to provide sustainable growth. And in terms of our outlook in terms of growth, we, would, we are get up towards economic clustering and agglomeration to drive job creation through rapid industrialization. We we'll drive industrialization Again, to mobilize private sector funding would avail land, especially land that is owned by some of our public entities and the government and also local government. And we will use also our fiscals to, because we have done a process of assessing the commodities that we procure on a regular basis and would use it to drive industrialization, especially in the remote areas of the provinces where we have to take opportunities. And this is a guarantee where would, would, would ensure that we have the necessary partnership and guarantee investors that they would uh, recoup their investment. We'll drive also extensive investment on infrastructure project with a strategic focus on economic infrastructure. We would also support local SMMEs to also make their own contribution in, 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 in the economy. 
We have also recruited more than 15,000 and additional 35,000 young people to skill them and provide the different skills so that they can contribute better in the economy. We have also supported a number of learners in the province to study both internationally and domestically. This is in an effort to make sure that we have highly skilled employees who can uh, uh, contribute better to the economy, but also play their role in terms of the development and growth of the province. In terms of our metrics is that, as we said, we want to expand our production capacity as the province, promote discovery and diversification, and enhancing stability and efficiency. And as we have stated that the province, it's a gateway um, to the countries located just right in the border and adjacent to Zimbabwe and Namibia, but also a neighboring province to Gauteng, Limpopo, and Mpumalanga. The province is divided into three regions, the Bojanala region, which is where our economic hub is. Majority of the mining operations in the province is located in the Bojanala area. And also importantly, it's where the special economic zone is situated that presents also opportunities for investment. And we've been, we have secured a number of investment, but we don't stop at this point. We are still going to proceed, and that's why we are here and also presenting, because you'd know that the special economic zone has its own incentives when you invest in a special economic zone. The Ngakamudirimulema District Municipality, it's positioned as an academic center and a research hub of the province. There are opportunities of cultural heritage, as I've stated, that we have Kaditsweni, which is a, cult, a, a site of cultural significance and also presents a huge opportunity, but there are other industrial opportunities and one of our international airport is located in Ngakamudirimulema. Dr. Ruth Tsirumutsi Mumpati, it's our agricultural hub of the province and the deputy minister is from, is from that region. And it presents also opportunities in terms of agriculture, tourism, and also cultural tourism. It is a home to the Taunskal, and importantly, it has a number of opportunities from potential of the mining that has not been uh, explored. There are a number of mining exploration rights that has been issued in the Mumpa district, Sukhumutsi Mumpati municipality area, and we are inviting uh, investors to partner with those who have the exploration right to pursue the mining opportunities in Naga in district uh, The Dr. Kenneth Kaunda district is one of our manufacturing hubs in the province, but also host to the World Heritage Site, which is the Freddy Ford Dome. And it's strategically located towards the N12 treasure route moving from Bumalanga towards the Cape Town or Western Cape province. In terms of our key investment opportunities, as I've indicated that we would use also our provincial fiscals to drive industrialization and would wish to address the entire value chain by making sure that there are opportunities from an input point of view by addressing agricultural uh, products that would assist in terms of inputs of production of some of our material would also drive agro-processing. In addition, the mining present opportunity in terms of mineral beneficiation, the automotive components, some of our industrial parks, we are revamping them to cater for automotive industry. The waste economy and renewable energy, as we've indicated, we are moving towards expansion in that space and we are inviting you to those opportunities. Technology and innovation, including and smart cities. There are about three towns that we have identified to advance the smart city concept and we have already started with the Mokwasi and Muruleng town, including the Harde Biespoor Dam to advance a smart city complex that is led largely by our housing corporation in the province. We wish to take this opportunity to thank you and indicate that the province 
it's open for business and it's a land of opportunities. And when you want to succeed, we are your home to succeed. And please feel free to be in contact with us. We are here to serve and make sure that we walk through this journey jointly as partners and that we ultimately result in the growth of the province. And as you grow, as we grow, you will grow with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, MEC. Uh, thank you for the snapshot into the Northwest Province. Uh, we hope after your speech that there's already an investment deal that only awaits your signature. So let's be on the, on, on the lookout for those investment deals. Uh, earlier on, you saw on the video that we shared that as South Africa, we inspire new ways. So the next speaker, uh, from the University of Stellenbosch, Ms. Anita Nell will actually come and present and showcase how we inspire new ways by presenting a new investment case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much and all protocols um, observed. Um, I would like to speak about um, what our university is doing and why university technology has always been a highly overlooked um, investment asset, but is actually quite an important one. I just wanna see how the, okay, there we go. Okay, our university is ranked among the top 350 in the world, um, consistently on the top three of the, Af the African continent. We have 35,000 students, a third being postgraduate, making us a research intensive university. There's a lot of inven uh, inventions and new technology developed at our university. Now, normally, the way to commercialize that is by patenting and licensing. When we license, um, the, the problem is that, um, that our, our industry is not yet so mature in South Africa that they can necessarily take up and absorb a very early stage technology. So, as a result, when we license the technology, most of our value for our technologies are created offshore. So the other option that we have is to create a spin-out company. And we do that very early stage. We ring fence that technology in a company and then we invest in the company or find investment and then service the market from, um, well, globally. The problem, however, as I mentioned, spin-out companies of university technologies have never been a, a big hit or even on the radar of, um, of investors. It has always been a very overlooked investment asset class. So we tried our best to, um, to reduce the risk for investors. We started an incubator where we provide extensive services, including programs, but also precision incubation for our companies. We developed a tool, an online tool, that is available for any entrepreneur who wants to start from, I have an idea, but is this a business? So it takes you through the entire step there's a lot of education. You can see we take it literally from validating your idea, looking at your customer segments throughout to the point where we actually um, help them to set up a, um, a data room. And by the time an investor walks in there, 80% of that data room is already fully populated because we have huge experience in, in raising funding. We think we understand what investors want. We went even further and started to spin out concierge this concierge negotiates on behalf of our 30 plus companies in our group, um, huge discounts from service providers, legal services, um, bookkeeping services, etc. We also take the, the burden of a lot of the administration out of the hands of the, of the young, mostly young um, entrepreneurs and CEOs so that they can focus on bringing the, the business to the market. We ensure that excellent governance is, ma is maintained in these companies. So by the time an investor looks at the company, there's a, already a, um, a whole set of uh, minutes and of board meetings, um, shareholders agreements, etc. Everything is in place. Okay, the good news is we can do a lot with a little. And I'm going to, to show you what, what we have done. We actually raised a fund. It was the first fund in Africa investing solely in university, te university technology. We raised it from our office. It's called the University Technology Fund. But although this fund was raised by our university, it is a national fund. So some of the universities co-invest, but this fund was actually set up 
on the 31st of January 2020, yes, two months before COVID. It was a disaster, or so we thought. However, um, throughout COVID, it became the most prolific early stage investor in the country. The fund has, has invested 160 million rand in 22 companies. That's just 9 million US dollars or 7 million um, British pounds. Some of those companies received multiple rounds um, of investments, and you can see our university actually got a 57% share of, of that. Um, and we have also extensively co-invested. These are only the companies in, in our portfolio, and you can see how they go through the pipeline. We start with um, building a pipeline with a very small amount of grant funding that's up to 500,000 rand, which is half a million rand. Um, the next stage is seed capital up to one and a half million rand, then series seed up to five million, and then series A over five million rand. You can see how the pipeline is building and how some of one, one of the companies at least went through the entire pipeline. Um, this was only our companies, but if you look at the total portfolio within the, the UTF, um, you can see it's a, the, the global sector classification. There's also, um, well, we obviously exceed quite well in terms of um, youth employment, but we are looking very strongly at women employment and ownership as well. This fund created 111 new jobs. So I want to look at the impact of our university companies. This is our university's spin-out timeline from 1998 until this year so far. You can see what happened when we put when we actually established a physical incubator on our campus. Good coffee, excellent vibe, and where researchers could see their peers opening companies. And they actually started believing that they can do it as well. Our spin-out um, activity has really mushroomed. These are some of the companies in our group, quite a variety, and they, well, we have 10 faculties, and even our music department has established a company. But what's important for me is that we have more than 400 staff members in, this company, in these companies. You can see it's still, most of them are still very early stage. The dividend income that we as a shareholder receives from, um, from this group of companies has over the past two years by far surpassed our royalty income through our patents. It is now becoming a reliable income stream in 2000, uh, well, last year, the combined turnover of these companies was 422 million rand. That may sound low, but it is 22% up from the previous year, which is again 22% up from the previous year. Our companies, being from university research, where universities are, are actually trying to make the world a better place, that, that mission spills over in our companies, and our companies are actually doing very well in terms of the um, sustainable development goals. Okay, so we are raising a second fund today, well, on the 10th, tomorrow. Um, the, U the University Technology Fund is literally scraping the bottom of the fund and, and closing the, well, it, it will be depleted. But by February next year, um, UTF2 will be up and running. Um, it is. This fund will be expanded to not only invest in university technology, um, but also in the alumni of universities. So any alumnus from a university in South Africa who starts a new company will be eligible to apply for funding. We de-risk um, the, the assets as far as possible. Um, they, they have already raised 222 million rand, but the aim is to finally um, have a, well, to finally have 400 million rand available. We have already a very good track record. Um, and then, yeah, I think it is, it's a great opportunity. The, the mere success of the first fund that was sort of um, born in a stage where no one thought it could, it could succeed. And here we are four years later and we are raising, well, we are very close to operationalizing the, the next fund. If you look at the, um, at the countries um, in which university funds um, invested in spin-outs. And this, these figures are actually over the past 10 years, but our fund has only operated from 2020 to 2024. If, if that, this fund's data was included in the data set here, it would have been, I think, in eighth position. 
Okay, so the opportunity is to invest directly in our university spin-outs. Um, we have fantastic um, companies. We have one company with absolutely no market in South Africa. They, say they built um, control systems for satellites. NASA is one of their clients, Airbus, all of those. Um, our shares, oh, well, the value of our shareholding in that company has increased 350% over the past year alone. That company seems to double their income nearly every year. So this is the type of things that we can achieve with deep tech um, from the deep south there. And I think it is, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And, and I think also I'm here as the first person from a Stellenbosch, oh well, from a, a local university talking about spinouts in the past history of this, um, of this um, AFSIC conference. So um, I would like to in invite you to come and speak to me and look forward to, to more investment from, from the community here. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for the inspiring presentation. South Africa is indeed a land of opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, please note that the session will become interactive as, we, as it progresses. So we are not just going to deliver presentations <coughs> only. You will be able to interact with the speakers uh, later on. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Deputy Minister in the Presidency, Honorable Kenny Morolong, to the podium as he delivers the keynote address for today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Let me uh, preface my speech by requesting you to pardon my voice. I have uh, been unwell and I'm recovering from a very terrible cold. High Commissioner of South Africa to the UK, Ndade uh, Mamabolo, Deputy High Commissioner, Ms. Matlaku, members of the Executive Councils uh, representing two of our provinces, MEC Musenuhi, MEC Molapisi, and MEC Mayor, the entire South African delegation, the investor community, ladies and gentlemen. Let me take this singular honor to greet all of you on behalf of our government and our people. We convey our special greetings from the Presidency of the Republic of South Africa on, who, on whose behalf I'm here to address this important investor conference. We are thankful to the organizers to convince such a big number of investors interested in investing in our continent. Africa is home to about 1.5 billion people, constituting roughly 18.3% of the world's population. The combined gross domestic product of Africa is about 3.1 trillion US dollars. Africa therefore has a huge investment potential across economic sectors and jurisdictions, probably the biggest frontier of global growth. Why are we talking about Africa and not South Africa? As you might know, as South Africa, we see our development and economic prosperity as intrinsically linked to the rest of the continent. In this regard, we are using the Africa Continental Free Trade Area to drive investment into Africa to ensure our economic prosperity as an African country and for the rest of the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, we are operating in an environment in which your political and global trade is rapidly changing. We have in the recent past experienced weakened global growth, rising tensions, conflict, disruptions of global supply chains, global energy crisis with rising cost of energy especially for the planet, food insecurity and heightened threats to cybersecurity. The global economic growth trajectory remains sluggish in 2023, returning a mere 3.2% growth, which signified a decline compared to 3.5% of 2022, according to the International Monetary Fund data in the World Economic Outlook. 
This sluggish growth was in animated in the developed economies, especially in the Eurozone, due mainly to the disruptions in the global supply chains, especially in energy products, edible oils, and fertilizers. These brought about a sharp rise in prices of foodstuffs, leading to heightened consumer inflation that is devastating, especially on the poor. This also gave rise to high levels of food insecurity, especially in the developing economies of the world. This being said, leaders across the many sectors of our society must rise to undermine these challenges, to give humanity a sustainable chance of survival. We have to deploy all our resources to ensure sustainable growth, secure those who are food insecure, reduce tensions that disrupt global supply chain, invest in productive sectors and network industries that stimulate economic growth, especially in emerging economies. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here as Team South Africa, which I have the honor to lead to showcase opportunities for investment in South Africa. To assure you that South Africa is an investment destination ready for investment and to do business with you. To give assurance from the South African presidency that our country is a democratic and rule-based destination with active and participative citizenry. A periodically elected parliament and government independent judiciary, a thriving private sector with a strong banking system. South Africa is one of the world's most stable democracies globally and offers investors a stable operating environment. Our country tracks about the 60 across all indices of the Ibrahim Index of African Governance, sometimes referred to as IIAG. The more Ibrahim Foundation has created an IIAG to track governance across four indices, namely security and rule of law, participation, rise and inclusion, foundation for economic opportunity, and human development. All these indices are scored out of 100 where a score of 100 signa signals exceptional performance in that index. Our score in all of these indices and the features of our society to which I earlier referred, combined to tell a story that our country is serious about business and the overall progress of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU-South Africa trade relations can be seen as partnership working together for sustainable future. South Africa is the only African country that has strategic bilateral relations with the European Union. Through this relationship, a lot of investment opportunities are on offer for the European countries that are interested to invest in South Africa across the value chains of just energy transition and the development of green hydrogen industries. Across the energy the green energy transition, the EU invests about 1 billion euros in various facilities to support the development of South Africa's green hydrogen industry and net zero related investment, according to the South African Revenue Services trade statistics. All these trade investment and support mechanisms will be implemented carefully, taking into account that while our economy is diversified, we are still a commodity and nature resource dependent country. How to ensure that as we decarbonize, we don't undermine our economic development or disrupt livelihoods remains a priority question for consideration. Program director, the UK remains an important and strategic partner of South Africa. We maintain a healthy current account surplus between ourselves and the UK, albeit declining over years. South Africa is is the UK's most important trading partner in Africa, and we are the only African member of the G20. In this regard, South Africa's presidency of the G20 represents an opportunity for deepening bilateral ties and cooperation in a range of sectors such as others, the development of critical mineral value chain, just energy transitions through initiatives like jet partnership, enhancing and deepening investment and trade relations through South Africa to the rest of the African continent. In all these, these are opportunities to be leveraged 
by the peoples of both our nations to enhance trade, economic, and people-to-people -people relations. Ladies and gentlemen, South Africa is, most globally, is the most globally integrated and diversified economy. It is about 7 trillion rand, or if you like, a 304 billion euro or pound economy, rather. From this kind of diversity, a number of investment opportunities in South Africa emerge, which are on offer to you as an investment community. These range from infrastructure projects, especially in our network industries, such as electricity generation, transmission, and distribution. The rail networks, ports, and container terminals at our harbors, road network, and commuter trail in our cities. Investment is also needed in agro or, or agricultural technologies in our rural and farmlands, as well as agro processing, warehousing, and distribution. All of these, to mention just a few, represent the opportunities available to investors to deploy capital to greenfield projects, support existing projects, and to improve supply chain I mean, supply value chain in South Africa, taking advantage of the 1.5 billion people in the African market. We seek investment that are truly developmental, that transfer financial capital, develop skills, and grow our economy. Our South African businesses, especially our small, micro, and medium enterprises, stand ready to either partner with you in these businesses uh, or in these business endeavors or participate in supply chain opportun opportunities that arise from such mega investment. Program director, we've identified infrastructure development as a key frontier of our economic, economic growth. In this regard, our national development plan stated above is to achieve the gross fixed capital formation of 30% to GDP. However, our fixed investment level hovers at about 15%, 15.6% to GDP. Thus, a funding gap exists between our goal and deployed capital in, in terms of executed projects. This signals a great opportunity for investment and deployment of capital from you as investors, deal originators, and fund managers. South Africa needs an extra $85.6 billion worth of private sector investment over remaining years of the 2030 target bound. We are here to say these opportunities are there for you to take up and invest in. Over the last three years, Infrastructure South Africa has, take, has, a, has in turn curated a bankable pipeline of projects that appeals to the investor community. In the Infrastructure Investment Handbook, ESA has profiled priority infrastructure projects, the size and scale that will have a significant impact on the economy. They underscore the deeper collaboration models between the private and public sectors that ESA has embedded over a period of time to develop a comprehensive pipeline of bankable projects. In some of the projects, we intend making fiscal allocations to de-risk them and make them attractive to private sector participation through public-private partnerships. We believe that investment in these mega catalytic project will stimulate economic growth and increase aggregate uh, demand. Thus, our business case is that your investment will yield returns for you. Therefore, this represents a business opportunity for you, which we encourage you to take advantage of. I have made a long-winded proposition to you to simply say this to you, that South Africa is open for business. Come and invest in South Africa. Thank you very much. Deputy Minister, thank you for, for providing context and setting the tone for today's discussions and for the inspiring words and speech. I think investors are now encouraged to come and invest in South Africa. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, earlier on, I actually promised that the session would be more interactive. And actually, I'll hand over to Mr. Aravile Kumete, uh, who would ensure that the session is indeed interactive. Thank you.
Let me begin things then by just observing all protocol as well, because it is very important um, to do so. To the Deputy Minister in the Presidency, Mr. Kenneth Borolong, the High Commissioner, Jeremiah Mababolo, Deputy High Commissioner for South Africa, of course, in the UK as well, Deneo Matlaku, to the MECs for both the Northwest Province as well as KwaZulu Natal, government officials, business leaders, APSA, of course, as well as many other corporates, Brand South Africa, and everyone else, our remaining and wonderful guests. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. The name is Arabi Lekumete. I'm a financial journalist. And I want to start off in a moment or two by introducing our guests, but I'm going to say this from the onset. This is a, a good news story for South Africa. If we've wanted a new frontier, if we've wanted a reason to get into what is 100% the most advanced, whether it be by infrastructure or other development in the continent of Africa, we're certainly speaking about it today. We're not just talking about a place that exists as a certain utopia. We're talking about a place that has maintained hope that has grown its economy, that has withstood the test of time, no matter how difficult things have been, and maintains that desire to lead today. And I will implore all of us to not only invest in South Africa, but also go out there and seek further investment in South Africa. So allow me to uh, bring on, on stage then Ms. Mamed Zimavsimola, the head of infrastructure South Africa, Mr. Ness Roa, the acting head for syndication and transport then for the Development Bank of South Africa. Ms. Cheryl Burst, the CEO of APSA International. And Mr. Ed Harkins, the director for trade and export finance at the South African Chamber of Commerce for the UK. Now, the reason, ladies and gentlemen, they get a journalist to host a panel discussion is because the aforementioned part, it's fairly easy. Oh, sorry, sir. But this is where the critical questions get asked. And so they make me the bad guy. <laughs> but it's fine. I will do the hard slog and I will do the hard job. But please allow us to, to engage in the session. We hope that you can also ask questions a little bit later on. And we'll ask that a roving mic comes around as well if you have any questions yeah. for our panelists. With that being said, why don't we start off with the main aim of the conversation, which of course is infrastructure. And I will ask then, if Ms. Mamed Masimola could just perhaps share, to start off with, just the critical roles that are driving, the reason why this critical role of driving infrastructure in South Africa, one, is so important. But also, what measures is infrastructure perhaps implement or implementing infrastructure in South Africa to ensure the acceleration of project rollouts, especially in sectors such as transport and water infrastructure. So what are those measures? Thanks so much, Arabile, um, the program director for this particular session and my fellow panelists um, as well. Um, just to, let's start off by explaining perhaps the role of infrastructure South Africa in, in the country. <coughs> we have been established uh, by the president in um, September of 2020 to drive the infrastructure investment program on behalf of the government of South Africa. So we are an infrastructure development agency um, that is uh, concerned with raising uh, or closing the infrastructure investment gap by developing, by um, coordinating and facilitating high value infrastructure investment um, initiatives. Um, so um, the government of South Africa says there needs to be an infrastructure project pipeline that is bankable and so Infrastructure South Africa is uh, a, 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 a development agency, an infrastructure agency, charged with uh, essentially developing a bankable pipeline of infrastructure projects. 
We look at the, the priority sectors on our side are the network industries, so is energy, is water and sanitation, um, ICTs as well, infra, uh, information communications technology, as well as um, transport, and in transport in the main, free transport, so looking at the ports, uh, looking at airports, um, etc. And then of course, the lastly is the human settlements uh, uh, sector or integrated housing as um, some will, will call it, uh, mainly because it drives uh, construction uh, 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 jobs. It also enables uh, municipalities or subnational uh, governments to invest in municipal bulk infrastructure. We are um, spearheading and championing the infrastructure program by ensuring that these projects on an annual basis, we get to um, announce uh, these projects that are ready for investment, um, that are ready to crowd in private sector financing, that are ready to um, inject private sector participation in one way or the other. Our focus is on projects that are PPPs in nature, uh, projects that are blended finance candidate projects, um, as well as commercially viable um, infrastructure projects. So anything, uh, pr these projects of a value of one, one billion rand and above, those are the type of projects that come through the window of Infrastructure South Africa, and we are driving um, and facilitating and accelerating the implementation of these projects. We also work, Arabile, um, uh, we concern ourselves upstream in terms of uh, ensuring that these projects are well prepared and packaged. We are the one of two um, pro uh, agencies um, outside of the National Treasury that get um, receive um, funding allocation from National Treasury to prepare and package um, priority infrastructure projects uh, to ensure that they get to a bankability stage or they are uh, viable enough uh, to receive funding from both the fiscus, being the national treasury, as well as uh, leverage private sector financing. So that's basically will be the space that Infrastructure South Africa would, would play in, working very closely with uh, infrastructure SOEs. A lot of people that are sitting in the room will be familiar with Transnet, um, the, the freight and logistics uh, um, uh, state-owned company, Sunral, um, the roads agency in South Africa, TCTA uh, that deals with bulk uh, water supply, um, and, and um, uh, companies like uh, Petro SA, uh, for example, and as well as ESCOM. So, and, and also, of course, uh, national government departments, municipalities, etc. but in the main, those will be the, the type of projects that Infrastructure South Africa is concerned with. Thanks, Arabin. Does that, does that just, to, just to a quick follow-up, maybe, if I, if I may, it, does that change as well the timelines with regards to these projects as well? Because one of the key factors that have always been asked is whether the length of time it takes to complete these programs may come from maybe lack of planning or a lack of coordination and, and the like as well. Is that, is that something you, you would perhaps take on? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, the primary challenge that we're facing is the, the ability, just the, the, the capacity to prepare and package projects. So the financial and technical engineering skill sets that sit uh, within government mm. to prepare and package these projects um, has been uh, decimated over a period of time. So we've rebuilt those skill sets within Infrastructure South Africa. Uh, to up, uh, they say that um, one of the reports that we, we, we know um, uh, says that you know, only 10% of projects um, that have been conceptualized actually get to financial close at some point. There's just this de uh, value of death mm. that they go through. So that's, that's one of the things that we are addressing. The other component is on underspending uh, on projects that are already allocated funding. Yes. And so we are also providing technical support on the infrastructure delivery side sure. uh, to make sure that we are truly ensuring that these projects are, are implemented within, within time and within, within budget. Um, that's what we focus us, we concern ourselves with. Fantastic. I mean, one of the, the key elements also to all of this is that we've had the key 
components of partnerships, and whether it be public and private, however that works is going to be very critical in doing this. I mean, uh, Deputy Minister Rolong, you, you spoke about South Africa needing, what was it, close on $86 billion to fulfill some of its infrastructure project raising, I think it was as well, a moment ago. Um, Cheryl, I mean, when one looks at your profits, maybe you can just add to that pile. Don't you want to just throw in a couple, <laughs> a couple of billion to that? Uh, uh, APSA supported the entire visit, right? So how exactly will you play a role in this? Is it on? Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Hermila. Um, yeah, I mean, our, if we look at APSA and, and what we actually do in the UK, we, we have licenses in the UK, the US. We're also operating in China, and that is really our sole purpose here is to um, engage with key decision makers, be it government, um, be it multinational corporates, be it institutional investors, around what their strategy around trade and or investment into Africa is. Um, we, so we, we obviously look to, to support government um, as well as private sector as much as possible. So we've been delighted to be a, one of the lead players in terms of the roadshow that's taken place um, over the past week now of the SA government in the UK. I'm really a, a, a proud supporter of that because it talks exactly to our strategy. Um, I think what's really pleasing as well is that uh, the week before I was in the US and the SA government was also there led by President Cyril Ramaphosa um, and there was a key SA investment summit as well um, and there was a South Africa round table on the sidelines of the UN um, General Assembly meetings. Um, and then I think a couple of weeks before that, we were also pleased to see Cyril Ramaphosa lead the um, investment um, uh, in terms of the FOCAC, which is the, um, the alliance that we're seeing in China um, and investments into China. So we're really excited to see South Africa really starting to lead the way now in terms of saying we're open for business. Um, there's significant trade and investment opportunities. Um, and you know the, the messaging is out there and certainly the opportunities are there. If we just look at the UK um, in particular, obviously there's a deep and shared commitment between UK government and South African government to look at the opportunities that exist. The ties are historic and they're deep. Um, and recently, over the past year, we're seeing um, trade between South Africa and the UK um, uh, uh, reach the amount of over 10 billion sterling now, um, of which 5.3 of that is um, imports from South Africa into the UK. There are over 11,000 UK businesses invested in South Africa, surely demonstra uh, demonstrating the, um, the support and the opportunity that UK businesses see in South Africa in terms of, of investing investing there. And we're also seeing the likes of DFIs playing a role. So BII has invested over two billion, into, uh, two billion sterling uh, into South Africa, has created over 54,000 jobs and supported, and supported a few thousand businesses there. So for us, this talks to our strategy we, um, we love the fact that we're able to support government and we certainly see the opportunity and so see ourselves as an important link between government and private and corporate sector as well um, into the trade and investment opportunity that is South Africa. Yeah, an interesting conversation because I think <coughs> overall it's just getting that support and I think what happens now is, is getting to know our government of national unity a little bit more internationally. And, and that is the essence of bringing about hope. And if corporations are then following them, that clearly indicates that the faith in South Africa still remains. Nothing's changed ultimately. When the National Development Plan was launched in 2012, I'd only been a journalist for about two years at the time, but it became a key focus area for me to try and understand what were the goals, what were the aims, etc. And unfortunately, with about six years to go now, we're not near where we need to be. That is just plain fact, right? It's not, it's not trying to badmouth South Africa in any way, but what it does mean is that from a low base, we have the opportunity to grow it even further. And one of the, one of the op institutions that can do that the best is definitely the Development uh, Bank of South Africa. And so, Mr. Nesro, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, if I may then, and really just ask about the sectors that look to be 
pertinent in investing the most here? We talk about infrastructure overall, of course, here, but you know, in this case, does it go on to become retail spaces? Does it go on to be housing? What elements help grow South Africa a lot better from here, you think? Okay, thank you. So DBSA um, as a DFI, which is 100% owned by the South African government, has got a mandate that speaks to Sub-Sahara Africa, the development of Sub-Sahara Africa. In that mandate, um, in as much as we are looking at uh, Southern Africa, we've got 60% of our investments in South Africa in terms of our book, and 20, 40% which is spread across, across uh, the Sub-Sahara Africa. In terms of the sectors that we look at, we are looking at sectors that sort of unlock development across the continent critical value chains that unlock mineral extraction, manufacturing, that unlock uh, trade, that, that unlocks trade and also mass transit in terms of public transport system. So from a sector perspective, what we're looking at is energy, transport and logistics, ICT, water is a key sector. But we're also, we also look at social infrastructure, health, education, because we think that this is important in ensuring that we've got capacity in the continent to be able to deliver on the specific uh, economic goals. So from, from that perspective, as a DBSA, we focus on the infrastructure that will unlock development across the continent. And we think that there are other players that can then play in the retail space. Uh, they're more better placed in that space. So commercial banks, um, IDC in the manufacturing space to play in that, but for us, once we've got the backbone infrastructure that's there, we can then unlock the development uh, across the continent. Yeah, I, I don't know if you have any perhaps examples or, or, or you know, just some of the more successful investments uh, that the DBSA has perhaps been a part of that perhaps you could share a little bit of. Just thinking on that, um, what we have done as a DBSA um, is to sort of support programs that are quite key within each continent or each country that we operate in. So for example, in South Africa, which is one of the most successful programs that we <coughs> have supported and initiated is the Renewable Energy Program, that we have worked with government, <coughs> the Department of Energy, to ensure that there is investment in the generation distribution of power in South Africa. So that energy program has been one of the key aspects or programs that were supported as the DBSA. Some of the projects that we have funded within that program include the Impofu Wind Farm uh, in, uh, in Eastern Cape, which is a 336 uh, megawatt project, 11 billion rand in terms of investment capital, mm -hmm. but DBSA provided about 3 billion of that. And I'm happy to say that 50% uh, of the investment that we provided was given or supported uh, local players, the community, to participate in the, in the projects. Another example that we have also is Umoilanga Hybrid, which is an onshore um, uh, wind and solar, as well as battery energy system in South Africa as well. We also provided 50% of our investment uh, of 1.7 billion for local players, for local uh, participation and communities to participate in the project. So these projects sort of gives an idea of sort of the programs that DBSA has to <coughs> ensure that we unlock economic development, supply of power, mass transit in the, in the country as well. So work is being done. That, that is a clear element to just say that no matter what may be said, the work is getting done. South Africa does have the ability to do so. And I suppose further, further endorsement of that, further understanding of that, is definitely at play. And I just wanted to point you as well to this little leaflet um, as well that should be in and around us uh, right now. And if you haven't taken a read through it, please do. Because if you're wondering what infrastructure developments, how good South Africa's infrastructure growth has been and is right now, there are absolutely incredible examples here, things that perhaps not many of us even knew of. And I implore you to please take a look at the leaflet talking about investing in South Africa. Mr. Ed Harkins, good right. morning to you, sir. Good morning. Um, this is 
typical weather here, isn't it? This, this rain. A little bit. I'm, I'm I th sad to say. I think that's the reason the deputy minister is also sick, actually. So we're going to blame you for that. <laughs> um, so um, you've, you've successfully hosted the deputy president um, over the last week, of course, the deputy minister, and amongst other ministers as well, other government officials, um, so many as well. What perhaps could you, could you perhaps share then over the last week as, as your engagement has come about, what has, has really meant you, you can see the step forward for relations, but also just the growth of South Africa? Oh, good question. Um, well, I think what I observed, and actually just to say, I mean, the chamber, um, I look after trade in the chamber, and the chamber's primarily here to drive trade and investment into and out of South Africa, and mainly made up of uh, volunteers like myself, and I'm an ex-banker, I used to work with, with Cheryl, so I'm very privileged to, to be here. I think what I observed, um, over the last week, really, was just the, the, you know, and, and our role is really getting the message out there. But and it's a really positive message, yeah. uh, as you said. Um, South Africa is open for business. Um, we had uh, that message from the Deputy President, from His Excellency the High Commissioner, um, also from the new Minister for Public Works um, and Infrastructure, who I think talked about how he wants to make South Africa um, a big building site. Um, and get on and really drive projects. Um, so there was a really positive message. Um, as Cheryl said, uh, they've been in the US, they have been in China. So there seems to be a real emphasis to uh, get the message out globally yeah. that South Africa is back open for business with a stable government, uh, you know, strong rule of law. It's the place to invest in Africa on the continent because if you want to do uh, you know, set up a hub on the continent, on the continent Af uh, South Africa is the place to do it. Um, so that I think what I took away from last week is, is that really strong messaging and commitment. I mean, a lot of the team are still here. They've been in, in London yeah. for, for <laughs> 10 days. Um, that's a long, way, long time to be away from, from home. So I see real commitment, real energy, uh, and a real drive to, to get on and make the changes that South Africa needs. All these people need to, need to go home and finally do that work, right? Yeah. right? At some point. Yeah. So get after back 10 days weather. or something, at some point, they need to all go home. So yeah. we have to leave you here, though, right? So what does the chamber then do to drive that investment growth, that investment idea for South Africa then, moving on from here? Well, another, another good question. Um, I, well, as I said, we, we're here to try and connect and, and drive uh, trade and investment into and out of South Africa. How are we doing that? Well, we obviously had the honor of hosting the delegation uh, last week at two, two functions, including the High Commissioner over there. Um, I think this is the um, fifth or sixth time when I counted it up, Mamitsi, that we have yeah. hosted you and your team in the last 12 months, but either here in London or in South Africa between myself and uh, our, our outgoing chair lady. So we, we're already doing a lot in this space. Um, we're keen to do more of that um, and host sessions with uh, government ministers coming in and out of South Africa to bring together our members like ABSA um, and non-members um, who can deliver um, both infrastructure or professional services or uh, legal services and actually bring together all the people in the room that can actually deliver the the change and investment that South Africa needs. So, so more of this sort of thing. Really. Yeah, have you found more private partners looking to get involved as well? Or is that the message also to plug into, to say, look, we need the private sector to also be able to play a part in this because it benefits them ultimately in the end as well? Well, look, I think that there's been some challenges in South Africa, but that obviously creates opportunity. And, and when you start talking about the kind of numbers that, uh, of investment that South Africa needs, and I think um, someone's talking 60 billion. Um, I looked up, I think, to hit the UN's um, sustainability um, goals by 2030 requires $330 billion worth of investment. Mm. So what that means is every source of liquidity and investment, be it equity, um, debt, bank, bond, export credit, needs to play a part. And I think uh, we can help connect the dots and bring the right people into the room and bring um, banks like ABSA in to, to yeah. deliver the needs that South Africa has. Confidence is a big part of that, isn't it, Cheryl? I mean, if you have confidence that indeed the country is on the right track, is looking to move itself forward, is finding that development to be a key part of its growth, then corporates get involved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, we, we, we've always historically seen corporate investment. Um, I think more recently we've seen some disinvestment 
Um, but I think now we're starting to see um, the excitement and the interest um, growing into South Africa. I think it is, everyone said it, but really also key as we look at the wider continent development and growth ambitions and the opportunities that we see in the wider continent, mm -hmm. that opportunity for South Africa to be a gateway into Africa is real. South Africa has the deepest capital markets. South Africa is the most liquid. Um, South Africa has the ability to, to raise the financing. So it, it makes sense that it positions itself as a, as a gateway. From our perspective, you know, we are a pan-African bank. We operate in 12, we're a systemic bank in 12 countries in which we operate with our headquarters in South Africa. And so we're naturally key financiers um, into government. We support ESCOM, we support Transnet. Um, so we've supported a number of projects. We've also been the, uh, one of the lead supporters of the renewable financing program. So as a bank, we have financed ourselves over 50% over um, of the REAP program. Um, and we have financed what equates to over 5,000 megawatts of power that has been brought into the grid. So those are the type of opportunities that we exist. But I think, as has been mentioned um, by, by my fellow panelists, is that it is, you know, across Africa, sovereigns have been challenged. Yeah. And so private sector needs to work alongside sovereigns to, to find the mechanisms. As banks, we need to, being a commercial bank, we need to work with other institutional investors, we need to work with government, we need to work with other commercial banks. There's space enough for everyone. But really important as well that we work with DFIs. I think that the, the partnerships between DFIs and banks are critical in order to make the financing or the opportunities financeable. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we certainly see a lot of opportunity there are headwinds to work through the mechanisms, but um, the opportunity certainly there and the return and the benefit certainly exists. We have to get excited about this, right? Because if anything, this is the development of South Africa taking it further, another frontier, another growth area, another growth spurt, if you will. We keep talking about green shoots. I'm not tired of it just being green shoots now. Now I need it to be a little bit more than that. Now, Mitzi, you, you've, you've al always had a, a pipeline now, and I, and I think you've been able to, to garner and grow so much as an entity now that you've got these pipeline projects. Are, are you able to share any, any promising projects to look forward to, to keep us galvanized and understanding that there really is this development and this growth moving forward? Thanks, or, uh, Arabile. And, I mean, one of the things that you've just mentioned now is around building confidence yeah. um, in the work of government, especially in relation to the building um, of this uh, uh, pipeline of bankable projects. Just to indicate that um, from, from our side, um, internally, how we work is that we, our governance structures um, includes uh, the participation of some of the DFIs, um, as well as the Infrastructure Fund and the National Treasury. That's very important because uh, just at the, the entry level, just when these projects are being onboarded by Infrastructure South Africa, we have a validation committee. For example, it's chaired by ISA, of course, but it sits in the KFW, you've got the World Bank, you've got Infrastructure Fund, you've got National Treasury. Um, and as these projects move uh, in different pro uh, stage gates and approvals are being sought throughout uh, the, the appraisal uh, process, that at every stage and at, at every governance structure, there is both the government part as well as the private sector part. So at the apex of these projects being um, recommended uh, to get into the national treasury space for, finan for funding, and if these projects have to go out um, to, to, to uh, seek financing from, from um, the capital markets, et cetera, that structure, uh, for example, it's chaired by the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure, uh, whom the Infrastructure South Africa reports to, and it sits in there, the CEO of the Banking Association of South Africa. For example, BASA, I mean, all the commercial banks in South Africa, including APSA, are, am, are members of, of BASA. The, the point I'm making is that the projects that we are 
uh, 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 spotlighting the projects that we're bringing visibility uh, on and it's included in our infrastructure investment handbook um, they have been carefully um, uh, uh, um, uh, curated essentially yeah and uh, they have been um, uh, looked at uh, in terms of financial uh, uh, viability by both uh, government, including ourselves as Infrastructure South Africa, as well as your DFIs and, and, and in some cases also uh, commercial, commercial banks. So some of these projects um, that I can talk about now is um, a project Ukubu Selela. Um, this is a transnet freight rail project. It is aimed at um, supporting OEMs in the form of Ford as well as BMW, uh, they have manufacturing plants in um, Pretoria. So we want to be able to upgrade working with Transnet to upgrade uh, the rail network to get these cars out of uh, inland in Pretoria through to the port of Kebeha and out into export markets. Uh, this is a 9.6 billion rand um, uh, investment required by Transnet. Uh, two billion rand of, the, of that money um, has been secured from National Treasury as part of the risk in this project, uh, working with uh, Infrastructure Fund, uh, JJ, there at the back, um, to de-risk that project. So the rest of the money, uh, the Infrastructure Fund, will work with both the IDC, DBSA, and Transnet to raise the, the balance of that funding uh, from the likes of um, APSA and, and others that would be interested in, in, in investing in that project. That's one of the, uh, the, the economic sort of uh, projects, uh, economic sector projects that I can speak about. On the social side, uh, the one of the most interesting ones is a um, hospital um, in the Western Cape, Tiger Beck Hospital. Um, it's a tertiary hospital um, in terms of the categorization in, categorizations in South Africa around these hospitals. They will be seeking to build a, a new wing to the, pro to, the, to the existing hospital uh, to create a, another 900 beds um, for, for the hospital. It's a PPP project. Um, it has been, um, it will be going out to market, uh, for example, to look for, uh, to, for, for funding, yeah. um, as well as the, the actual construction of the hospital itself. Uh, the Minister of Finance has been saying to us that uh, even if we're looking at social infrastructure projects, they have to show that uh, they can inject private sector financing and private sector participation one way or the other, because gone are the days where uh, we would look at projects that relied 100% uh, from, from the fiscals. Um, so we have also pivoted our own project pipeline to align with the requirements uh, of National Treasury in that regard. So that would be one of the social infrastructure projects, for example, that I can speak about that would be of interest to, to, to the colleagues sitting there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, one must remember that, you know, just with regards to the first project you even mentioned as well, right, vehicles in terms of South Africa, at least 400,000 vehicles leave South Africa now are set for export. That was a 13% increase from the year before, 13%. So imagine what the infrastructure development now could do further if we increase rail, for example, yeah. and the transportation of elements like our vehicle exports. What that does globally, forget just in South Africa. Right? We're talking about one of the top exporters of vehicles across the continent. Right? So I, 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 think, I think those scenarios are, are definitely very helpful. Uh, Mr. Roo, I'm going to just come to you as well very quickly as well to, to unpack just a key sense, uh, and that's just the timer, just letting us know we must nearly be done now. Um, oh. And then I'm gonna ask for questions in a little bit as well. Uh, Mr. Roe, just because this conversation relates to DFIs like yourself needing to be a part of this process, how do we let people like the Development Bank of South Africa get in a little bit further on this process? What happens from here? Sure. Um, so, the need for capital uh, to unlock infrastructure development in Africa is so huge that one entity is not able to bankroll that. So as the DBSA, whenever we're looking at investing in projects, we're looking for opportunities on how we can catalyze our capital 
uh, so that we bring in other capital, private sector capital, institutional capital, international capital into the projects. And, and how we do that is the certain approaches that we follow as the bank. Uh, one of them is a solution we provide as a lead arranger where we get appointed by the project sponsor and then we engage our partners from a funding perspective so that they can come in co-finance with the DBSA. Another aspect that we also do is we've got what we call a project preparation division. That looks at project at an early stage. We support project sponsors. We develop the project so that it reaches bankability. And once it has reached bankability, we go out to market and raise capital for that. Because there has been shortage of projects that are bankable from, from a funder's perspective. And that project preparation uh, capability is to enable us to unlock new projects in that way. Another element we've also used is where, as a DFI, how do we crowd in private capital? We take sort of a back-ended solution or we take long-term uh, tenors in its, its transaction. We allow private sector to come in like the likes of APSA. Also, we work with the ECIC, which is uh, uh, Export Credit Insurance Corporation in South Africa which then allows us to bring in commercial banks in transactions that we'll be doing. Mm -hmm. Those different approaches enable us to unlock a lot of capital across the continent, uh, across the world, yeah. so that we deploy that into investments yeah. and, and, and in that way. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Um, just any questions? We'd like to ask if there's anybody who's got a question. We do have just three minutes or so uh, for <laughs> that. We've got a question right in front here. I don't know if anybody's got a microphone for Unless you can just say the question to me and I will then just say it relate to the rest of the room. Thank you very much for this. Um, I don't know if it was mentioned or not, but I think there it is. That now that's what we call service delivery. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most exciting things that's happening in South Africa, um, I suppose the rest of the continent, is the creation and the regeneration of Johannesburg through the Josie My Josie process, which mm. I believe APSA is a partner with us. So we're creating something called Education Town. Imagine if we were creating Silicon Valley of Africa in the heart of Johannesburg CBD. And that's where really you have the manpower to back everything that you're talking about. I would love to hear a little bit more about that because I actually represent that process in the UK and the US and I would love to find out who's interested in partnering with us here to contribute to the 55 million pounds we need to make Education Town perpetually funded to offer free education to the most marginalized who then mm. come and support these industries we're talking about. Mm. Fantastic, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. We're going to just get another question in the meantime as well. Cheryl, I don't know if you want to add perhaps to that because it's one of the, the projects you're also involved in just as APSA overall. Yeah, I can, I can comment on that. I can't comment on this uh, project specifically. Be, being based in the UK, I'm a little bit more casual from that. But yes, the bank does, does is focused on that project. But I think, you know, large part of our strategic objectives is around being a force for good as well. And so that only isn't only about supporting infrastructure projects or the like, but it's also around the, the development of societies within that. So that talks to city regeneration. It talks to affordable housing. It certainly talks to infrastructure. Um, three of our key strategic priorities is around financial inclusion um, and also diversity inclusion as well, which then supports uh, women-led businesses. Um, coupled with both of those naturally as education and also looking at the societal benefits um, that, that can play a role in that. So any of those projects um, we certainly are interested in because it, it meets our strategic objectives, but also in the conversations that we have globally, that's also what DFIs are focused on as well. So it's around that societal good. So how do you combine commercial objectives um, with societal good and longevity and sustainability on the continent and, yeah. and in South Africa? Look, I, I, folks, I don't think we could finish a conversation like this even in three hours, unfortunately, right? And so we're unfortunately going to have to close it there. But one thing I want us to know for sure is that our speakers are here. A lot more other people are also here with regards to this conversation. So let's continue to have it beyond just this room as well. Just with regards to uh, closing remarks as well, just want to let you all know that we're all part of a significant process of growth for South Africa. And we'd like all of you to then be a part of it. 
Daniel Matlako, the Deputy High Commissioner, thank you so much as well for being here. I know you were initially going to deliver closing remarks, uh, but because of time we are unable to do so. But thank you to everyone for being a part of this, and may we continue to invest in the South Africa story. Thank you so much, ladies.